Today's episode of the Gestalt Education Show is brought to you by three of our favorite sponsors, Human Locomotion, Core 360 Bell, and Dynamic Disc Designs. All the information can be found below. By now, you have definitely heard us talk about them, so check out the show notes, click click the links, use the codes, and uh, make sure you support our favorite people. Uh, As always, we got a great episode lined up for you today, and thanks for tuning in. All right, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Gestalt Education Show. Today, we're back on home turf. Brett, we're enjoying a little wine. Um, we're going to talk today about... Here's a little cheers. Yeah, Shay. Shay, cheers. You know. Today, we're going to talk about red herrings, Brett. And so I thought some red wine for some red herrings would be a, a perfect match. So this is something that you've you've kind of alluded to a lot in a lot of your talks over the years, but we never really dove deep into it. And so I'm, I'm excited today about that. And we'll, we'll kind of get to that in a second. But uh, behind me, if you're watching on the YouTube... We released the full schedule for the DNS World Congress, and uh, it, it took us a while to put this all together. But Brett, we did this kind of intentionally, you know, yeah, like we 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 pretty we took our time putting this all together. And you know, one of the one of the cool things about creating a congress like this is that we can kind of like uh, hopefully orchestrate a goal in mind. And I think the big goal in mind with the DNS World Congress is to expose the depth of DNS Mm -hmm. and uh, the amount of kind of tentacles that DNS can have. And and I think that we've done that with the people that we have here with all the American instructors, as well as uh, some, some prog influence too. And and I'm super excited for it. Super excited for it. Oh, I think the, the lineup's great. And then, you know, as we've alluded to before, Pavel has not been here and uh, I mean, it's gotta be seven years at this point. So, um, you know, he had such a huge influence in me early on in my career. And I, I mean, I was lucky enough. I got to see him so much when I was young and uh, so I'm excited for the people that haven't got to see him yet just to kind of see because, I mean, no one leaves that encounter not being mesmerized. I mean, it's just uh, it's uh, it's very special. So I think like that in itself. And then we got Marcella. And then, as you said, I mean, the lineup after that just just kind of rolls. I wish we could fly even more Czech instructors over. But, you yeah, know, we're. Yeah. We did what we could do, and uh, it, yeah, it's going to be a very, very, very special weekend. So. Exactly. So, uh, as always, guys, um, I'm more than happy. If you got a group coming, uh, reach out to me. I'll, I'll give you some group pricing or something like that. But uh, we'd love to have you there. There is continuing education credits for chiropractors in PACE certified states as well as Missouri. And so uh, we're working hard to make sure that we get those all done. The difficulty with, with uh, congresses like this is that it's kind of hour by hour CEUs, therefore, if I can't get information from the speaker about their talk, then it's not going to be covered by CUs. But I guarantee that we're going to have at least 12 for the weekend. And uh, so we'd love to have you there. Uh, go to gestaltedu.com backslash DNS dash Congress, and it'll be in the show notes, but we'd love to be there. But without further ado, let's kind of dive into this, Brett. So uh, red herring, black swan, uh, canary in the coal mine, whatever you want to call it. Basically, what we want to break down today is what, how do we pick up on things that are not one are out of the ordinary and two, when things aren't going well, like how do we actually come up with these things? Like how, how do you know when something's not going right in your case? And I think you've told some great stories over the years, uh, of those types of, of cases where maybe you do find some scary stuff. And I, I was kind of hoping you would maybe start off the podcast with telling a couple of your stories and, and some of the things that you've, uh, you've kind of seen over the years that, that you've tipped off. I think that, uh, the most important thing is probably being present with your patient. Cause the, the first thing is you got to care and you got to be paying attention. The other thing is, you know, the lost art of a really good physical examination, you know, like we are just in the Western part of the world, we have just gotten away from like a good old fashioned hands-on examination. And I think that, you know, because we have our hands on our patients all day long, like no one's in a really a better position than us to kind of notice these little subtle changes with our patients. And, uh, yeah, I got, I got a bunch of them. You know, I have, uh, I have one that I know you like that I tell that, um, I had a guy that, you know, he came in with, uh, like threat mid thoracic pain uh, off to the right side. I'll never forget that. And, uh, you know, I, we assessed him. He had a really stiff thoracic spine. He had poor, shoulder girdle stabilization. He had the improper respiration stereotype, all the things that, you know, everyone would have found nothing special skill there. Um, so I did the usual, we, uh, manipulated his thoracic spine. I, uh, did a bunch of DNS, stabilized the shoulder blade. He had his shirt off, he gets up and 
I've never seen someone's shoulder blade do what his shoulder blade did, which just started like almost like it was schizophrenic, just like just started like shaking. And I was like, that's odd. So then uh saw him a couple of days later, he comes back, he's no better. Um, in fact, I think he was even a little bit worse. So I do the same thing over. He stands back up, shirts off again, see the exact same thing. And I you know, you don't know exactly what it is, but I've never seen it behave that way. So that right there, I figured, you know, I've seen, you know, I've, I've worked on thousands and thousands of patients. That is not something I'm used to seeing. To me, that was a sign that I need to get some imaging. So we get a thoracic spine x-ray and sure enough, unfortunately for him, he had had uh, breast cancer that had metastasized to his thoracic spine and that, that ended up being his pain generator. So I think like the important point is you don't always know what the diagnosis is. I think like people think like you're like house MD, like making the exact thing. You don't know what it is. You just know that something's behaving a little bit differently. And because of that, then either you make a referral to somebody else or you do imaging, uh, or you, you're just curious and you want to, you want to find out like what, you know, what's going on. And I, mean, I would just say from the litigious side of things, uh, you would be wise to do that anyways, because the, you're, you're finding a way to kind of cover your tracks. And, uh, in, in this day and age, you need to do that anyways. But if you look at NCMIC, I mean, anyone who is getting in trouble for missing things. It's basically because the patient was not responding and they continue to do the same thing over and over, or at least their note looked the same. And, uh, so they, you know, they never changed their course of action. They never, you know, did more imaging. And, uh, I, I'm just, all, the more people looking at a case, the better I feel like, and yeah. we're like that here. It's like, I mean, if, if they want to, you know, see their medical doctor, orthopedist or whoever it might be, but by all means, we love them to do that. Cause that, I hate to say it, you're shedding liability, you know, and yeah. yeah. So, but, so there's that one. Um, I like to tell the story about, um, <laughs> thinking I had missed Parkinson's disease for so many times where I was like working on these patients and I could just tell like real subtle changes in muscle tone. And they, uh, you know, I would send them to the neurologist and, and again, these aren't like, you know, they didn't have cogwheel rigidity. They didn't have resting tremor. They didn't have the things that, you know, typically Mm -hmm. that we're used to seeing with those cases, but ever so slightly, we saw like a change in the tone in their, uh, in their muscle presentation. And, you know, so they would send them back to me and they'd be like, you're basically your chiropractor is a fool. And, you know, he, he misses, you definitely do not have Parkinson's. And as time went on, I learned that literally every single one of those ones had Parkinson's disease. I just was like catching it at the very front end of it. And, uh, this is not a subtle brag or a flex. This is just like literally just paying attention, you know, like, uh, we always say range of motion of the joints is the camcorder or crime scene. Like, so what did, what did I notice? I just noticed like an, you know, ever so slightly a change in the, in the tone and, or even like the deep tendon reflexes. I mean, that is like completely underrated, like what you can learn from that and how just everyday manual therapy can, you know, change, you know, that presentation. But, um, those are, those are, you know, a couple that kind of stick out, but I think that, you know, Irvin core who, you know, he was telling us this 50 years ago with the viscerosomatic reflex, which basically any catastrophic problem that's going on in your body, um, is going to manifest itself in the musculoskeletal system. So that can be through tension tone trigger points and then eventually joint blockage. So, you know, we're, I know we're going to talk about the, the auditing system here in a second, but like, if you're, if your audits are not changing, and I mean, if, if like in the case that I talked about before, if there's like a drastic change and not for the better in the auditing process, I mean, you should like, it should put up your antenna to think, you know, we're used to people kind of getting better, you know? So, I mean, like if, if the, if the functional side of the case is not improving, I mean, I think that gives you a really, 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 really powerful tool to get ahead of some of these, you know, really, really important things that could be stealing your patient's life. And I, I, I truly believe, I don't know what the exact numbers are here, but I would think that all of us here are saving at least two people's life a year just by being really thorough and just like, I mean, honestly, just paying attention to, you know, the case that's in front of you instead of like being, you know, uh, sidetracked to something else, email, you know, life being busy, whatever it might be. I don't think it's difficult too, because, you know, we're, we're kind of talking about all the scary stuff right now. You'd have a similar case of, uh, someone I was just reunited with that, uh, Terry had came in, he had this weird rib pain on his left side and 
had been everywhere. Doctor did an x-ray, nothing came back, blah, blah, blah. I treated him like two or three times and same thing, just like I didn't change anything. Like functional changes, you know, uh, his symptoms were the same, like everything was the same. And so the next thing made sense to get imaging. Sure enough, he had multiple myeloma, like blah, blah, blah doing fine now but and it's easy for us to talk about those things of, of catching them but i think it's also uh it comes down to paying attention but it also we can catch other things too like mm-hmm. you talked about parkinson's but it can be functional changes that are leading to other issues down the road too so i think it's a it's a difficult thing to 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 make sure you're checking up on the functional changes which we talked about in at nauseum by now but also like sympath or uh what am I trying to say? Uh, subjective changes, man, I couldn't say the word. So subjective and functional changes need to be something we're auditing together, even though we talk about not necessarily uh, auditing subjective. Well, the tricky ones though, like the one that's in the chronic pain hospital exactly. where they're coming in and they're, they're telling you they're no better. So like if you're a young, young clinician, automatically, you're probably like over imaging stuff mm-hmm. like that. So I think like, you know, being able to, you know, pull out that centrally mediated pain or that chronic pain or centrally sensitized case and understanding that is what it is, even though they're subjectively not telling us they're better, it's because they kind of have a smudged interpretation of their, of their pain. So, you know, being able to decipher that case from something that's a little bit more sinister, I think is probably the trickiest thing that, that we're doing, but that's where like you get the imaging, you get the blood work. And once they've been cleared, then, then you're stuck with that (laughs) right? Right. to get them better. But, um, yeah. I think maybe that's the difference between uh, me in year one versus me in year six or seven, whatever I'm at right now, mm-hmm. is I think that spotting that case has gotten easier. Therefore, the sinister stuff maybe is a little bit easier to kind of pick up, if that makes mm-hmm. sense. Yeah. You know, you can kind of classify those patients a little bit neater. And so, um, you know, it's something we're going through with our young docs right now of it's okay to image. It's okay to get laughs. It's yeah. okay to do that early <clears throat> on, especially if you have a, a gut reaction. But the problem is I think people will do that and then not learn from that. Right. Meaning they'll take a, take it away. Like, well, shit, I, I, I thought they had cancer. Now, now they don't now. Ah, oh, man, I'm a bad doctor. But in reality, like, <laughs> now that, they never image again. Yeah. Yeah. And so in, in reality, you've got to take that in and, and learn from those mistakes early on so that that way you can apply it later on. Well, uh, in clinical intuition is clinical recognition. So, you know, we've all been in the treatment room where something just did not feel well. Something's not sitting well with you with the, with the case. And it's hard to know, like, is that magic? Is that like some special, you know, force or whatever? And what it actually is, is it's basically pattern recognition. So no different than Bobby Fisher. I mean, I won't bore you with the story again. But um, anyways, being able to, you've seen something a thousand times. Now it looks just a little bit different. Mm-hmm. And I think like a really good theme that, you know, I've been talking a lot about lately is on the on the lecture circuit is situational IQ. Like really at, at the end of the day, we're no different than Sully who landed a plane in the Hudson River, um, Wayne Gretzky, Michael Jordan. I mean, all these people who like when when all the Tom Brady, when all the pressure's on, all the chips are pushed in, you make really, really good decisions. So what is that? I mean, that that to me comes down to being really good at critical thinking. And I always tell a story of myself, like I, I have a really good memory which makes you not a good critical thinker in in my opinion. So like I kind of had to rework my brain a little bit to like be really good at critical thinking. So in our world, what critical thinking is you've gathered a bunch of information. <clears throat> Where's your portal of entry? And not everything is so binary and cut and dry. Like, so there's a 60% chance it's this, there's a 40% chance that it's this. So like, you know, being able to make a good decision when things aren't so clear. I mean, anyone can make the obvious one, but it's the one where it's a little bit, you know, fuzzy and hazy. And I think like really good doctors, they just, they just stack those one upon another throughout their day. Like they just make really good decisions. No different than Wayne Gretzky makes a good decision on the ice in game seven of the Stanley cup and Tom Brady in the super bowl. Sully landed a plane in a, in a freaking body of water who knew that was possible. So it, it doesn't have to be just sports. It can also be like um, in a, in our jobs. And I feel like we're all in a really unique position where all day long we're seeing like really tricky stuff and like, the best are the ones that are able to go in there and know what they need to do. And, you know, when they need to punt on a case, they're able to, to punt, you know, that's exactly right. And I think like, 
it's hard to, because it was hard for me, you, you, me listening to you about that when I was young about like, well, you just need experience to go through those things. And it's, it's, it's really the, the truth. You know, you need to fail. You need to go through and over, you know, we talked about over imaging, over labbing, whatever, over referring and, uh, getting your teeth kicked in on these cases and stuff. And I think that's what makes you aware of them. And I, I think just going back to your audit process, you know, we've talked, we had a whole podcast on audits, but if you don't have a systematic way of auditing the body or something that you continue to come back to, it's so hard to then know when things aren't going right. So I know like you have a, a systematic way that you're going to palpate the body. It doesn't matter what their complaint is. Like at some point during that case, you're going to go through their entire body, check the soft tissues, check the joints, check the range of motion. And then when things are off or not changing, that's when you can make it. Absolutely. I, I mean, I think that again, not to keep using house MD, but like, I think people think that great clinicians, they like walk into a treatment room, they immediately know. That's not how it is. It's like a failed trial of care, sometimes like two weeks, three weeks, or or a couple of days, depending on the case. But and then not not seeing the changes that you're used to seeing. And then and then I, I've just learned like when I have a feeling that something's not right, a lot of times it's not right. <laughs> so um, and I think, again, that, that's just simply by like the reps of paying attention as you're uh, going through your day. Yeah, so yeah. true. Yeah. And, and I, I don't know. I just think like the more experience you have with it, the more you pay attention, the better it is. But then then, Brett, like what about um, I don't know, an example I have was uh, I had a. Um, uh, well, I have a case right now, a knee case. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, um, patellar subluxation case mm-hmm. recovery of function for that is usually not too bad. Right. You know, like something it, it it's usually pretty easy. And so I, I kind of want to talk about uh, recovery or maybe finding red herring functionally. So for this case, for me, wasn't getting better. Didn't trust the knee during like some, some different athletic movements, still had symptoms, swelling, things like that. Turns out full thickness, chondral defect of the tibial plateau and like some other just kind of weird things in the MRI. And so, uh, but what are some ways that you kind of catch up on those maybe functional things that are different than finding, you know, cancer in someone or something like that? Yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, if, if, again, if you've changed the functional profile of that case, like you've done a really good job over, you know, three weeks or a month, completely change the function of that and the athlete or the patient's basically telling you I'm exactly the same, then there's two possibilities there. Either you're dealing with like essentially sensitized patient, that chronic pain case we were talking about before, or you know you're dealing with like a structural problem that you're not going to get around. And I, and I think that's the one that you're alluding to right now, which, you know, when I was young, I literally beat myself up over cases that I couldn't help. Like I... Um, you know, one was had coffee with us this morning. I mean, that was yeah. my first professional athlete. And uh he had femoral tabular impingement, hadn't even officially been described yet. Well, you know, he goes to spring training. I hadn't helped him at all, you know, and so um he's the same. So he gets a spring training and they fly him out to Philippon. He does a surgery. He does amazingly well with the surgery. And uh and I mean that was like really humbling for me because I remember like thinking to myself, like Okay, this is my first professional athlete, and I am literally falling on my face. Like, but really, I didn't do anything. I didn't do anything wrong. I, right. I did the best I could. And then, you know, you're you're not going to get around poor structure, which is beautiful because basically what that means is the patients entered the funnel in the right direction. So you and I are just like gatekeepers into the next thing. The problem is in the Western part of the world, everybody's entering the funnel in the wrong direction. So they're starting with the orthopedist. That doesn't make sense. Like start with us. We weed out everybody out. And I mean, like our orthopedists, our referral network, they love us because they know when we send somebody to you, don't send them back to us. Like they've already failed with us. Like we we're ready for you to pull the, the trigger on surgery typically. Which I think is like what, makes us in such a good, you know, we've talked about it before, but makes us in such a good position when it comes to sports medicine, to musculoskeletal health is like our gift to our patients is a really, really good trial of care. And you can't have a really good trial of care if you don't have, uh, you don't have a set standard as far as what that trial. Yeah. You don't have baselines. Exactly. Yeah. Have to. And so I think like, uh, you know, Mark King would be excited that we're going to talk about this next subject I'm going to take you on, but it's care plans is care plans oh, and yeah. systems make so much sense. And we think about systems, I think in, in our office and which we're kind of the opposite. We we're more systemized in our treatment room than the office, which is kind of what makes it fun. But you know, like if you don't, if you don't have an approach that includes a trial of care in an outlined, like specific trial of care, I think it's difficult to get your patients to stay on board. Oh, yeah. And I think that's something that you've really hammered home with us, uh, young docs and throughout the, the lecture circuit as you, you, you've got to start somewhere. And so what are that look 
looks like. For us, it's twice a week for three weeks. Mm -hmm. You know, at the end of twice a week for three weeks, we're going to reassess. We're not going to kick you out. We're going to reassess. And I think reassessment is a great time to maybe find some of those issues. And if you're dying of Mets at three weeks and you make a good decision at that point, you're fine. Like, I mean, you're fine anyways, but like you're fine from a legal standpoint, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think that's like the really important thing about like a trial of care within a reasonable time frame is as long as you make a good decision at, you know, early on, then you're, you're fine. Like no one expects you to pick up nets. Right. You know, the first visit. I mean, right. there's no way to, to do that oftentimes. So, um, so anyways, that, that's the beauty of it. I mean, you know, it, it kind of fixes itself. And then like, um, you know, like we said before, like at three weeks, I don't, I don't tell the patient, I guarantee you, I'm going to get you better. I might like, if I know I'm going to get him better, I might give him a little nudge in that direction. But I, what I say is I'm going to reevaluate you in three weeks and we'll see where you are from a functional standpoint. Right. And I think like the most liberating moment a clinician can ever have, if you can pull this off is when you actually go all in on function. It's like, so it's so relieving mm -hmm. because like you just, it takes all the pressure off you. Like, it's just like, you're 80 years old. You've, you know, you've never, you know, had any body work done before. Like, did you really think I'm going to get you better in a visit? I, I mean, of course we can change pain in a visit, but I'm not going to change the actual function of the case. And now the hard part is you have to sell yourself a little bit because you got to give yourself the visits to be successful. And that's the hardest part. Mm -hmm. But, you know, like, you know, and I, watching you evolve, I mean, you've done so good in this. I mean, it's like, you finally reach a point where you're like, okay, I'm done. Like I'm done like chasing pain because it's hurting my batting average, you know, like, and you know, we kind of jokingly talk about the batting average, but like if somebody's not willing to do what you say, they're hurting your batting average. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, now I'm just so honest and upfront with people. It's like, this is what it's going to take to get you better. I'm sorry that you have to see me, but that's, that's just the way that it is. And again, that doesn't mean they're addicted to you. <laughs> that doesn't mean you're some huge bleed on healthcare. Yeah. We learned on our last pod, podcast from Andreas Eklund that actually we are cheaper. Yeah. yeah. Right. yeah. <laughs> uh, put, put your patient on a maintenance care plan. Actually, it's it's cheaper. It costs the healthcare system less money. Right. The patients are happier. Like ev everybody wins basically. So um, I think like that's maybe a little bit of a mistake now is like people think that like you can't follow up with your patients, which that that's crazy. I mean, I, I, I will say for myself. I literally was arrogant enough when I started. I thought that I would fix everybody in a visit or two. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, those are out there. I mean, the, that will happen, but that's not the majority of them. Yeah. You know, these people get put on treatment plans and uh, lo and behold, they get better. I mean, <laughs> right, imagine right. that. Yeah, so. exactly. Well, and I think uh, one other thing you've, you've talked a lot about lately too is kind of like the gaposis right where you've got this crazy gap between uh never like surgery surgery yeah 100 percent uh recovery and then there's this intermix that's probably 80 percent of our patients that just need to be managed you got your harvey lillard miracle here yeah, yeah. you know one visit miracle adjustment so okay that you know, we all have something in our careers that happens once every five or 10 years mm -hmm. that is insane. Right. But, and then you have like the, that patient going to orthopedic surgery, which is actually less than 1%. So then you have everything in between, right? Yeah. And the evidence-based chiros right now, we're, we're in that group. Um, you know, that group is not doing a great job of managing those patients who are mm -hmm. in that functional black hole. I actually, we call that like a functional black hole because like that patient, you didn't get a miracle in two visits. And then that patient just kind of disappears off your schedule. Mm -hmm. Whereas that patient, you should just be continuing to change function on them. And like Lynn Faye, you know, taught us 30 years ago, um, that patient will turn like you, mm -hmm. you keep doing what you're doing, changing function and, um, the, they'll turn in the right direction for you. I had a bad wrap the last couple of weeks and you've been kind of laughing at me because I've had, I think three cervical fusion cases that have just <laughs> been, Oh, brutal. And you know, like you, you had one a couple months ago yeah, it was yeah. brutal and and i think the the difficult thing is some people would get a little bit scared of working you know the, the the one guy i got right now he's had two surgeries on his neck uh four level fusions raging uh, arm pain doing horrible uh static openers are basically the only thing that makes him feel better but the one thing i've learned from watching you and kind of talking about function is all you can do is just do your best with that patient, mm -hmm. you know, like what's the likelihood that he's going to go have another fusion? Yeah. Probably very slim, you know, like it's just the reality. They're stuck of, with you. Yeah. That's yeah. the reality. And so all I can do is just try to get relief and try to beat the functional drum. And if he comes around, awesome. If he doesn't, 
he's probably still stuck with me. So, you know, like, but all you can do is keep changing little by little by little. And if you beat that drum, then, you know, I'm not selling anything like he's feeling better. Therefore he's going to stick around. And I know that I've got to work on these specific things and I keep outlining it to him. Like, dude, I know you're still in shitty pain, but like, we've got to change this or you're going to keep going through this cycle. And if you want to keep going down the cycle, those are, that's fine. But I'm telling you, if we don't change this, it's going to, you know, things are going to happen again. And I think being able to outline that with patients has really changed my outcomes when it comes to this. Oh, absolutely. I mean, like the case you were talking about for me, like I had that lady in a static opener for two months, like no directional preference from the MDT folks. Um, you know, we were, we were doing DNS was kind of built in, but everything that we did was peripheralizing her symptoms. I mean, everything. So really at the end of the day, the only thing that like abolished her, her symptoms was a static opener of me just basically putting my elbows on a table and hanging her inflection. I literally did it for two months. Yep. And then finally, like we started to gain traction where she got enough relief. And then, then she had a directional preference. Then we were starting to really add some DNS in and, uh, I mean, not Knock on wood. I mean, it's going to all fall apart tomorrow, but like now she's mm-hmm. fine, you know? Mm-hmm. So, uh, I can, the younger Brett Winchester would have like punted that case and she would have ended up with a surgery. And, uh, and I mean, there's no telling, maybe she will end up with a surgery mm-hmm. at some point, but, um, sorry to interrupt this episode, guys. Hope you're enjoying it real quick. We have an amazing, amazing opportunity. The DNS world Congress is coming to Chesterfield, Missouri this June 14th through the 16th, 2024. If you guys attended our NDS or our Nerd Dynamics Congress, you know that we, uh, this is uh, something that's very close to Brett and I's heart, something that we are going to keep doing and keep doing and keep doing. So this year's Congress is all about DNS, dynamic neuromuscular stabilization. This is literally uh, like looking into the ocean, as Brett says. This is the lens that we look through each and every one of our patients with. And this is going to be an amazing opportunity because Pavel is back in town. So the originator, the creator of DNS, Pavel Kolash, is coming to the stage for the first time in five or six years. I don't even know how long it's been. Uh, He's bringing along with him Elena Kobasova, which is literally the backbone of DNS. Uh, She's one of the most underrated neurologists in the world. Uh, So we're super excited to hear from her. Uh, Marcella Safarova, if you haven't heard her speak, uh, she is literally the queen of pediatrics and musculoskeletal health. Uh, We also are going to have Ever, almost every single U.S. instructor at the uh, at the Congress who's going to be speaking. It's going to include demos, lectures, hands-on. Uh, we're going to have, as always, uh, a get-together afterwards with your chance to talk to these guys uh, face-to-face and have a couple drinks with them. This is going to be a great, great opportunity. There's also, it's a great price too, especially for students. It's only $4.99. Uh, so be sure to use the code DNS student uh, to get your discount on that. Uh, for more information or if you have questions, go to gestaltedu.com backslash DNS dash Congress. Thanks for tuning in, guys. Enjoy the rest of the episode. But anyways, I think like, you know, the one thing I've learned as time goes on, is give yourself enough time to be successful. Whatever you have to say to give mm-hmm. yourself time, because uh, if you're good at what you're doing, I mean, you're if you're changing the functional profile, not shockingly, usually the pain's going to change with that, and that's like the key to that. You and know? I think it's a good point of changing the functional profile. There's a difference between making people hang on when you're not changing that functional profile and changing the functional profile and keeping them on board. Yeah. If yeah, you're exactly. not changing oh, exactly. the function, then there's yes. no reason for them to be around. If you've been beating the functional drum for the last month and a half or so, and there's still nothing's changing, that should be the red herring in your mind saying something else is going on, and then it's up to you to be a doctor and make the decision. Is is it something sinister? Is it something orthopedic? Like what, what are the other possibilities of this case? And once you make that decision, then just start going down that path. People love when we order imaging for them because that's what they are used to. They go to the orthopedist. What's the first thing they're going to do? They're going to order. Imaging. Yeah, absolutely. You might as well save them a trip order the imaging for them. Be the one that interprets it. And just like Shacklock says, you know, it's not the imaging that's the problem. It's the education off the imaging that's the problem. So if you can be a voice or reason in that case, when it comes to the imaging or the lab work or yeah. whatever it might be, now you've just not only saved them money, you've saved the, hospital, the entire healthcare system some cash. So... Oh, a hundred percent. And you know, the baselines don't have to be like locally to the region of complaint, just as an example, because it was my mother-in-law. This one got thrown right in my face. Um, you know, she comes in, this is a couple weeks ago and she's like, I mean, my shoulder is killing me. I mean, and I've worked on her since forever, years, yeah. you know? Um, so, you know, I kind of know the history on her neck, blah, blah, blah. But anyways, no, nothing with the neck. Neck is actually like relatively free and clear, like on a range of motion assessment and uh, MDT assessment. Well, anyways, the one thing she cannot do, she, I mean, she literally cannot abduct her arm. I mean, she can't abduct her arm as if she has like a ruptured supraspinatus mm-hmm. tendon. Well, so I hung her inflection, like just to get the answer to know what I was going. Sure enough, like 10 minutes later, 
Like we're restoring our mood, you know? So like, I think when, um, you know, when we talk about baselines, like the baselines might actually not always be for her. The baseline was arm abduction, you know, like basically I hung her in flexion for three minutes and then she got up and the first time she did it, it wasn't a hundred percent. It was just a little bit better. Well, I kept doing it, doing it, doing it. And by 10 minutes later, I, the, I know what I need to do with her. Like I, I need nothing to do with the shoulder. I need to like do whatever I can to open up her IVF of her, of her cervical spine. So, I mean like that helps guide treatment and it, it sounds so easy, but for some reason I feel like I know that when I was young, I wasn't good at this. Like I need to know what I'm dealing with first to have a good, I mean, I'm telling you right now, 15 years ago, I would have been down a shoulder track with her. Oh, yeah. No cervical spine pain, nothing to even hint of cervical right. spine, you know. So that kind of brings me to my point, too, of um, I think my it, it always shocks whenever I have a shadow or something like that. They they shadow me the first day. I am such a McKenzoid that first day. And like I all I care about is getting the diagnosis right that yeah. first day. That is like the most important thing. And so I think that's another thing that's changed for me is simplicity. Simplicity in the treatment room gives you so many answers. The thing I always say to my patients is, I, you know, they've been to PT or they've been blah, blah, blah. I say, I want you to stop literally everything you're doing and we're just going to do this. Because mm -hmm. otherwise I don't know what's helping you. And that gives you your answer. If they come back the next day and they're the, exactly the same, audits are all the same. All right. Well, at least I checked that off. There. Yeah. And so, the, I mean, I'm just the simplest in that. And I've kind of stolen that from you that if I just change one thing, will it change other things versus changing 15 things to change one thing? You know, yeah, like you got to change something. You like, got to change you, something. Yeah. Yes. It's exactly. So to prime example, your mother-in-law, just whatever, rule that out. If, yeah. if the neck is wrong, then who cares? At yeah. least that's done. You know, at least that's you, you've marked that off the list. Or like in that case, so if you can imagine uh, my mother-in-law laying supine on a table, so I have her hung in flexion. So then I go right back to the same movements that she couldn't do weight bearing. So like she's in the table, I go, okay, so now uh, flex your arm and abduct your arm. Well, she's got, she's free and clear on the mm -hmm. table. Right. So that also tells me that this ha I have to be right on what I'm saying, right. which, you know, one of the things that, uh, the McKinsey Institute teaches people is, um, LCDF, which is like with every case, um, location, classification, direction, force. So the first thing we want to know is, do you have your location right? So if I wasn't careful with my mother-in-law, I wouldn't have had my location right because it actually wasn't her shoulder. It was her cervical spine. So if you kind of systematically work your way through your cases that way, I feel like you're able to pull out that red herring and you're able to pull out that non-responder quicker than maybe the average bird. Right. Just like if Tom Brady gets under center right now, he understands every scheme of defense because he's seen every scheme of defense. So that Therefore, he's able to make really, really good decisions versus name a rookie quarterback like the, you know, Tom Brady has that on him because of pattern recognition, you know. And I think like, as you were saying, like if you're a young clinician, you don't have the experience, but you could have systems in place to get to the same thing. The beauty of like a, you know, a 50 year old shitty chiropractor is that they may not be doing things perfectly, but they, they do have experience going for them, you know, whereas like a young clinician, you may not have experience, but if you have the systems in place, I do believe at this point, like you can get to the same, the same answer. I agree. And I think too, like, uh, just speaking from experience it, as a young clinician, just find ways to get your hands on people. You know, like for me, that was volunteering at the high schools. So like I, you know, as, as much as people want to get paid for what they're doing and things like that, which is great. However, like for me, my outlet for getting my hands on people was to go volunteer at the high school. And so that was an opportunity for me when I was seeing whatever, you know, maybe 40, 50 people a week. Well, I was actually seeing like 90 people a week because I was seeing 40 more kids at the high schools. Yeah. And so I think in a high pressure situation. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. So oh, like yeah. whatever you can do, even if that is volunteering at runs and things like that, like as brutal as those are to work in as little Little of marketing return as you get on those, at least you can get your hands on people, which I think is the whole benefit. So then all you can do is just keep working on your people person, or your, uh, your communication skills, keep working on your hand-eye coordination, keep working on your tissue sense, and that will allow you to kind of speed that process up quicker and going to seminars. I actually love that. That's a great thought. I mean, you know, I'm like literally obsessed with Nick Saban and like one of the, his things was always... 
Um, do not get hung up on the outcome. Mm -hmm. Instead, focus on the process, the, you know, day by day. All you can do, what, all you can do is help the person that's in front of you right now. Right. Mm -hmm. I know you want to work on major league baseball players. That's cute and that's great. But like, th you have to fix the eight year old that's in front of you right, right. now. Like, that's, you know, that's what you got to do. And I think that something about the younger generations probably are not. I don't know. That's it's hard for them for it some is. reason. Yeah, yeah, it is. Well, because we we want to shortcut it. We want to, you know, like uh, for me, like you, you were my big whatever my goal. You know, that's that's who I wanted to be, and so therefore I wanted to shortcut things. And so I remember early on, like I was like, God damn, like you know, I sent a couple of people to you, and you're like, No, you're fine, blah blah. blah. But I think uh, you know we have these great mentors, but the the genuine amazingness of a mentor is that they help you to bridge that gap. And so I think if they give you something to reach for, great, but you can't compare yourself to it. And that's something that Michael Gervais actually called me out on the podcast. Yeah, I don't I remember that. that. You know, I, I asked the question about basically, you know, Brett's done all these amazing things. Like, how do I catch him and stuff like that? And he said, he basically stopped me in the tracks and just said, that's an insane thing to talk about. You're like, you're on your own journey. Yeah, like yeah. he's your mentor. So carry that on, but you've got to figure out what that path looks like for you. And I think that that's a difficult thing for young clinicians is that we want to shortcut that. And we want to brag to our buddies because we saw a pro athlete and we saw 150 people that week, or we made this amount of money or we helped this many people or whatever it is. And in reality, like you said, you can only help the people in front of you. Therefore go all in on the person in front of you. One of the things I was going to bring up kind of at the end of this, Brett, and maybe we can kind of close with this is your quote. And I put it in almost all my presentations is, can you give the best performance on the biggest stage? And I think everything that we've talked to about today is basically culminating into that best performance. And I don't know, can you just riff on that for me? Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> Mark Sanborn who wrote a book called the on car effect. He brings up this amazing point where like, we're obviously not playing in the Coliseum. We're not professional athletes. We're, we're not on this like grand stage, but basically our grand stage actually ends up being our treatment room. Mm -hmm. So you kind of like behave like that, you know? And I think that, um, that, that always served me really, really well because like, I feel like you get the chance to kind of like put on a performance every day in your treatment room. Um, even though you don't really think of it that way, you know, typically, but, um, just, just like an athlete would. And also, I think uh, Eckhart Tolle, another really important book for me was uh, The Power of Now, which is uh, a book on present time consciousness. And he opens up the book and says he was somewhere in the British Columbia in Canada. So he sits on a park bench for two years and he's just mesmerized by a squirrel lugging a nut across like this grassy knoll or what you know whatever the the a beautiful sunrise a beautiful sunset and his point was you know you have all these people wearing headphones and stuff like that with a suit on that like are oblivious to all these amazing things that are going on in the world and i would just the connection i would i'd like to make is like take the time to understand like you blow up someone's mid tarsal joint or a subtalar joint check their hip range of motion after you do that like to start to understand like this interconnectedness of the body and that's what keeps us from burnout i feel like because like you just like you do i call these like little mini miracles like you do something crazy insane the only person that knows that the patient doesn't even know <laughs> <laughs> some higher being hopefully right. is overlooking you and like you have a moment with that higher being but like you're yeah man. you're like <laughs> so i mean that's like the the little games i feel like you have to play in the in the monotony and the like just we all know how these long days are i mean these long days of just getting ground down by the public and uh i feel like that's like the one thing that like kind of makes everything okay because you're just kind of playing a game within the game throughout the day that's right and I think too, I mean, like catching a red heron, like whatever that looks like in your day, like that's <clears throat> also kind of like a, a breadcrumb too. I, I always like, I love catching things like that, not because it makes me feel like I'm a high and mighty, but because it knows my system, like it proves my systems are right. Like and I mean, if you say someone's life, I mean, you, you walk out of that oh, yeah. day, like really, I mean, it, there's not a better feeling in the world when like you've truly like saved someone's life. Mm -hmm. Uh, but also I just like, it's, it's just another pat on the back, like another reminder, like keep going down the same track. You know, if you're missing these <clears> things or you're not finding them throughout your day, it, and maybe it's not cancer, but again, like maybe it's a functional thing or maybe it's an orthopedic an thing. An autoimmune like, disease. Yeah. Or? Yeah. Like if you're not catching them, then 
I think it, I think you should reevaluate your systems. Like that should be a check-in for you. Mm -hmm. And if you are like, bravo, like keep going, like keep proving it, keep improving it and things like that. Or like to reverse engineer. I I did this a lot. I still do this. Like, so, um, you know, your patient, you find out they have something that, either you weren't able to recognize or someone else mm. was, you know, so then like now you can go back like, cause you felt them before. And now, now that you know, they have, you know, that now you can feel and go back through. And that way you have a huge learning moment. Uh, I do that all the time. Like once, even like if it's musculoskeletal, like once we find out it's like some difficult orthopedic diagnosis, whatever it might be. Okay. Now I want to go, now I really want to feel like what, what I could have learned from that, that moment. And I'll be honest too. Like, and I mean, not everything is, is, you know, is perfect as we're making it sound. I, the story I haven't told is, uh, um, we had a patient who had triple a and, uh, so this guy comes into me, this is my first year of practice and he, I'll never forget it. He was moving railroad tides. Uh, he, he literally told me, kind of bullied me. He said, you know, this happens to me every year when I go to move, get, you know, in the spring when we move, get our flower garden ready. And, uh, you know, I felt this like really weird pain in my back. I go to the chiropractor, they adjust me, everything's fine. The second I sat down with this guy, I did it, the way he was describing it, even as young as I was, I hated it. I hated the case. Didn't touch him. Thank, thank the Lord. So I had x ray in our, in our old office. So sure enough, this guy's got a massive AAA. I mean, massive. So he goes up to the hospital here at Lincoln County and uh, Dr. Beale, the radiologist, he calls and he's like, you saved this guy's life. He's like about dead. Well, the funny thing about this story is, so then a year later, and we still work on the, the guy's wife, uh, she, so a year later, he dies of complications from the surgery that so basically the you guy, saved his like, life. Yeah, right. I, I guess I kind of, saved <laughs> but you were responsible. But then like, you know, what I still think of in his mind is like, um, yeah, like maybe he would have just lived another 10 years and, uh, you know, with the big old triple a and not, you know, so I, it, it's just a hard, it, it's oh. just a hard existence. I mean, I wish you, you go home every day with clean thoughts and stuff like that. But I think that like, um, you know, like if you're working with like the concussed athlete, if you're working with, I mean, we all know that feeling you, you go home at night and I mean, you're trying to be nice to your spouse, but all you're thinking about is, I hope I got that right today. Yeah. You know? And I mean, I think that's like the oath we all take when we become physicians is like, you're taking all that on. Not everything's going to be perfect. And yeah. you're just going to, all, all you can do at the end of the day is do your best. But there's a lot to be said about doing your best. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's a lot that that goes into that. And I think too, I mean, the, the point you always make that I always try to remember is the biggest stage is different every single day, every moment, you know, it doesn't matter who's in front of you. Like you never know the patient in front of you, what their connections are, how it's going to be. We always joke, you know, the person that refers you the most is the person you didn't help exactly, or the person, you know, the person that says, Oh, I'm going to refer all my people. They won't send you anybody. Not a second. And so, uh, you know, or, or that's the, uh, it's the little leaguer that somehow, you know, he grows and he pops and he's now he's a major leaguer or something like that. And so, he never forgets it, you know, exactly. Like, so, exactly. Yeah. So I think, I, yeah, you just got to show up. And I think that's, uh, that's you know, well I, said, yeah. that's why I was just going to show up. Mm-hmm. That's huge. I, I think that's the one thing if I can point, if I've, if I go anywhere in this career in my life and I can, I can fall back on, I've shown up. And I think you can say the, dan- the same thing too for yourself. And I think that's across the board. It doesn't matter what it is. You know, if you show up every single day, it doesn't matter if your spouse hates you or, you know, you had a fight or, uh, whatever you got stress or whatever it might be, just show up and you go through your processes every single day. Good things are going to happen. You're going to catch things like red herrings. You're going to help so many people. And I think that's the the burden, but also the, the joy of this profession that we've chosen. Yeah. That's how, that's how you were underpaid. <laughs> yep. You know, we're, oh, we're uh, overworked, underpaid. overworked, underpaid. Yeah. All the things. So yeah, yeah exactly. that's what makes it worth it. But anyway, guys, um, I hope you enjoyed this conversation. If we can just close with anything, continue to audit your patients, question your systems. Always, uh, always ask questions, ask why, and, uh, and just keep doing a good job. Yep, exactly. So, uh, anyway, we hope to see you guys at a future course. Uh, we got some great ones coming up. Lindsay Muma and Eric and Boland are coming here in a couple of weeks for the perinatal manual therapy course. It is unbelievably course. If you plan on doing manual therapy on women, period, 
uh, you should be at this course. It'll be, uh, it'll blow your minds. And so, uh, Erica is a, is a midwife now, uh, a certified. And so she's going to bring a lot of good stories on births. And, uh, Lindsay Muma is literally one of our favorite people. Uh, she's one of the best adjusters on the planet. Don't tell her I said that though. Yeah. Uh, Cause that'll go to her mind, go to her head, but, uh, she's one of the best adjusters on the planet and, uh, they're just full of knowledge. I learned something new from them every single time. And, uh, so we'll, ho- we'll hope to see you guys at a future course and, uh, cheers, Brett. Here's to, to catching some more red oh, yeah. and helping more people. All right, guys, have a great day and good luck with patience. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Gasol Education Show. Uh, if you liked it, share it, subscribe to it, uh, send it to your friends, send it to someone that needs to hear this message. Uh, we really want everyone to be able to, to tune in and, and get the, the best clinical advice that they can, which uh, we're hoping that we're giving to you with these special guests. So um, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us. Or if you have any suggestions on upcoming uh, conversations, let us know. Uh, for a list of our upcoming courses, we're adding them all the dang time. So go to gestaltedu.com, click on courses, and they'll all be right there for you. All right, have a good day.